Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes. It's okay. Good afternoon, welcome everybody here at the International Astronautical Congress and also to those following us on ESA Web TV and Twitter. My name is Lucy van der Tass and I am the Head of Talent Acquisition at ESA and it is my pleasure today to speak to Matthias who will be sharing with us some insights on how to become an ESA astronaut. So Matthias, you came back recently from space in May after nearly six months in the ISS with your Cosmic KISS mission. So what would you say was your personal highlight of your mission? Yes, good afternoon everyone, thank you for having me. Um, like being interviewed by somebody from the talent acquisition unit is already good. like it feels good. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, I had the pleasure of flying to space six months up there, and I need I have to say like every single day was a highlight. It's uh, if you ask for one special moment, um, it's riding a rocket. It's just incredible arriving on the International Space Station, seeing your friends, seeing this incredible station, and then floating to Cupola, seeing our planet Earth. It's just pure goosebumps. Oh, that sounds really great. Um, a question regarding your path to Cosmic Kiss. It was approximately 10 years between the day you were selected as an astronaut and the day you knew you, you were going into space. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit about what you did in that time, because I'm sure you were not sitting around twiddling your thumbs. No, it's like my, my path is a little bit special. So, um, you know that I was part in the 2008-2009 selection and um, at the end, like we were eight and a half thousand starting off. At the end we were 10 who were kind of passed all exams. But then the director general came to me and said, like, okay, I only have six tickets. You six guys, you fly to space, you, you and you, and Matthias, you're one of them, you will never become an astronaut. And that was a tough moment. Um, but he said, ESA is a great, great agency. We need great people. You convinced me, I want to hire you for ESA. And, uh, Please think of it, it's not only the astronaut job that is valuable, you can do a lot even if you're not an astronaut. And I took up his advice, I applied, I became ESA staff, um, I was working at the astronaut center, I worked as a Eurocom, so I talked with my yeah, astronaut colleagues in space, supported them, and later on I got an advancement and then I was in charge of development the astronaut center, so I could improve uh, international relations so I was traveling to China we tried to establish a cooperation with them and actually now we're building a moon training facility and that's also what I kick-started um, like many years ago and then a few years later the director general came and told me like hang on you guys had a dream uh, you want to become astronaut Matthias do you still want I happen to have a ticket and that's how I became an astronaut after waiting a little bit longer than my colleagues Oh, that must have been really amazing, that moment when he came to you with that offer. Um, when did you first decide to become an astronaut and what actually made you think about becoming an astronaut? So, m most astronauts, I believe, they were dreaming this as a kid. For me, to tell the truth, it's as a kid. I looked up in the sky and I didn't see astronauts, I, I, see, I saw pilots in very fast planes flying by. So I wanted to become a pilot and I wanted to see our planet from above, from a little above, not 400 kilometers above. And um, only when I was an adult in, in 2008, when ESA made this call to, uh, like for new astronauts, I thought like, hang on, what's the job of an astronaut? So today an astronaut is a scientist who works with the best of technologies. We work in international teams and we have the adventure of flying to space. And I thought like, hang on, it's like I'm a material scientist. So it's like research is what I like. Um, working in international teams, it's what I did. I lived in several countries and what gives me a lot of pleasure. And um, yeah, so I applied and I was lucky to be chosen. Well, you hold a PhD in material science engineering, right? And you also have a number of patents. That's pretty amazing too. So how do you feel that helped you in your path to become an astronaut? How did it contribute to what you do as an astronaut? And were there any other extracurricular activities that you did along the way which you feel helped prepare you to become an astronaut? 
yeah, so I indeed I have a PhD and I also have several engineering diploma and um, so I liked studying in different countries, learning the different language and um, so I think that was a strong asset because living in France, living in Spain, living in the UK, I learned a lot about myself, being a foreigner, um, like having to fight problems that I've never seen as a German living in Germany, um, that helped me, that I think I was growing mentally. Um, and also I learned that there are many solutions to a problem, not only the German solution to a problem or the French solution to a problem. And so I learned quite a bit living in different countries and um, I think that enriched me as a person. I also studied economy and um, as, well, as an engineer you want to always find the best solution. But the best solution is not always the solution that you can sell or that can be produced because budget is always very important. And so I think that also helped me to understand, okay, what is feasible and what is not feasible. Okay, thank you. Would you say that a PhD is a requirement, a hard requirement to become an astronaut? No, it's not. So it's a, it's a nice to have. I have some astronaut colleagues who have a PhD, but um, um, I also have astronaut colleagues who don't have a PhD and they are equally um, well as, as an astronaut as me or even better. So I think everybody of us has the individual strength and um, that makes our team so rich. We shouldn't all be the same, so that's important. True. Diversity, this is something we've been hearing a lot about, indeed. So, um, touching, we've talked a little bit about the qualifications and the hard skills, if you like, the technical skills that are required to become an astronaut. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about personality and what things that you would see would be very important. I mean, team spirit is something that's also we've been talking a lot about. Perhaps you could elaborate on that. Yeah. So living six months in space, it's very, very important that you're in a confined environment, you're living with people from a different cultural background, so different country, different language, different approach to handle difficult situations. Um, so you need to be prepared for that one. And we receive some training, but um, so we go into caves training, we are in extreme environments, so we are uh, like put into stress situations and we learn a lot about ourselves and about the team that we're with. And for us, I flew with crew three to space, we came together and said before the flight, okay, let's talk. Uh, we're all good friends, um, but I'm sure there's something that I could do better. So what do you think I should do better? And then I tell you what I think you could do better. And so we talked a little bit about our personal um, small, like not problems, but challenges. And, and I learned so much by talking about um, that one. And the mission was so easy later on because we already knew what our weak points and what our strong points are and everybody helped each other. So it's important to talk about stressful points before you actually are stressed. So it's a little bit about managing a conflict before it becomes a conflict, right? Exactly, exactly. Great. And then um, we're, we're almost nearing the end of the current selection process and we will know in November, the DG just said at the Ministerial, that we will know who will be the next class of astronauts. So can you share a highlight or a memorable moment from your own selection? Oh yes, so it's like the selection process, it's like living a dream, you're getting closer and closer to your dream. It takes a year and um, I believe in my case it was six different steps that I had to fulfill and the closer you get, the more expectations you have, the more hope you have, but also the more scared you are that you will get a, a negative answer and that you're rejected. And um, the very final round when I was told you will never become an astronaut, and it was really never, it was not, you will not become an astronaut today, maybe in the future. Um, that was I, was, I was actually falling into an abyss. That was such a huge disappointment. And, but I think it also helped me to uh, grow because life is not only like, like uphill, there's also downhill. And uh, we need to learn how also handle situations that uh, are not so positive to appreciate the good moments in life even more. No so. downs or no ups without downs, so to speak. Yes, indeed. So my last question before we open up to questions from the audience is what would be the, be 
the key piece of advice that you would give to somebody who would like to become an astronaut? So don't do my mistake. When I was a kid and I saw Ulf Meerbold, the German first astronaut floating in space, I thought that guy is a superman. So he must be he must be so excellent. That's nothing that I could ever do. So if you as a kid or as a young person don't dare to dream, you can never reach your dream. Luckily, I had my dream as an adult to become an astronaut. But uh, the advice that I give to everyone, only if you have a big dream, you can reach a big dream. And if you can dream it, most of the time you can also do it. That's very good advice. Thank you, Matthias. So we have some minutes before Matthias has to leave us. Uh, is anybody in the audience, do you have a question that you would like to put to him? Oh, okay. Let me come here with the microphone. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, thank you for, for sharing and, uh, all the, the information. And I wanted to ask you, do you have any flight hours? And is it a requirement to be an astronaut at, e, at uh, yeah? to be an astronaut and can, can you refine a little bit the uh, question like what requirement are you thinking of uh, flight hours do you fly as a pilot you mean yes as a pilot yes yeah, actually you don't need to be a pilot to become an astronaut um, we once we are selected we get a training to become a pilot so I, I was a glider pilot when I was a student so flying without an, a motor I really enjoyed this because it gives you the most freedom and um, so I feel that comes closest to be floating in space. Right now I'm, I'm doing my uh, pilot license for a single engine, a piston engine. I should have completed that one before my um, space flight, but okay, the training was so tight, I couldn't do it all before. So there's no hard requirement on this one. But some of my colleagues are professional pilots like Thomas or like Luca is a test pilot, or Tim Peake is a test pilot. Um, Samantha is a, is a pilot, so yeah. That was indeed one of the selection criteria for the last round. We needed a minimum as a master in a STEM subject or in medical, but there was also the flight pilot path as well. Okay, okay. that was a hard requirement? Yes. All right, I didn't know. N not for me. But at no, that time I had my glider it's pilot. It's either or. It's not both. It's ah. either or. Okay, okay. That either also was applicable in our case. So either test pilot or you have an engineering degree. Yeah, Correct. Exactly. Exactly. Any more questions? Yeah? Hi, very nice to see you here in person. I was just wondering who is the person that you look up to the most? Well, I think there are a lot of people that I can be inspired from. There are people like in my team that I learn a lot from, and there are people who flew before me. So I have a mentor, uh, Reinhold Ewald. He's a German astronaut. He's a really, really nice guy. He gave me a lot of advice, but I also have other people that um, I consider as mentor. You always, uh, for me, it's helpful wherever I am, in whatever position I am, there are people who have more experience than me. And um, so I ask them for feedback, <coughs> for feedback and for advice. And not only the more experienced one, but also the peers around me. You know that we have something like um, 360 degree feedback in ESA. So you ask also your colleagues how I'm, you are doing. And so I take inspiration from everybody around me. Thank you, Matthias. We still have time for a couple of questions. Anybody at the back who has a question? Okay, we'll take you and then you, okay? Okay, hello. Um, so I was wondering, could you tell us something more about the training for the moon? Are the current astronauts doing that? Or is that something for the next class? Or what is the plan? Yeah. Today I got this t-shirt here, it says Artemis, and uh, like all my astronaut colleagues uh, from the 2008-2009 class, we all got this shirt today, and we were presented to the press as being eligible for a flight to the moon. So we're all part of the team, some of us will fly, so far we don't have enough tickets to fly all. I, don't, my, I hope my story from my beginning doesn't repeat again, but you never know. So um, we all are currently being prepared. It doesn't mean like we are training every day for the moon, but we have in Europe several training lessons. One is called Pangea. It's in geological field training. 
and um, Luca Pamitano and I, we were the first to go through this training in 2016, 2017. Um, Samantha was already in this training, I believe Andy Morgensen maybe as well. Alex is currently in this training um, and I, I believe Thomas Pesquet will be in this training next year or the year after. So every one of us gets this training. We have another analog training which is called NEMO, it's done by NASA. So we are living underwater in a station and um, training on the, on the bottom of the sea how to explore Mars or how to explore the moon. And also in Cologne, we are now setting up a new technology and astronaut training center, which is called Luna. And maybe you've seen here, um, there's a three, um, virtual reality presentation of Luna. That's a new installation that will be, we will be starting to build by the end of this year. It will be ready like end of next year for early operations. And there we will have a moon surface, we will have gravity of floating, we will have a different labs like a dust chamber, how to uh, utilize um, the resources that we find on the moon. And in this, uh, in this new training facility, we want to bring in scientists, astronauts, mission experts, industry and students. And then <coughs> we also hope that we all together can develop new technology so that we have strong European technology on the moon. Right next to it, we will also set up a business incubation center because we want to spin off immediately new ideas um, for new products here on, on our planet. So it'll be a great opportunity and if you think of coming to EAC to make an internship, that could be an, a nice step for you. Thank you, so I'll find my way over. Hello. Hello, and my question is, what kind of physiological and psychological problem you face after and during the flight? Well, a lot on how you deal with that. Yeah, so uh, physiologically, a lot happens with the human body. Your immune system gets weaker, you have the fluid shift, uh, and that means like you have a lot of intracranial pressure. All of us astronauts in, in my mission, we had slight edema in the eyes. Um, that's an issue that we need to solve before we actually can fly to Mars. Because some of the um, medical experts believe if we don't handle this problem, we might travel to Mars and arrive there blind. And obviously you don't want to send people to Mars to be blind because you want to like, have people seeing Mars and describing how it is. Um, also we have muscle loss, bone loss, but there we have advanced already quite a bit. We have good training machines on the ISS and, and that's a, a, a good step. So I think we have learned a lot in these 22 years of ISS operations. Psychologically, um, we have this HBP, Human Behavior and Performance Training. We also go into the caves, that's one side for exploration, but on the other hand, it's also like psychologically being prepared to be in an international team in a stressful situation. And we have these moderated talks with our colleagues. Okay, please tell me what you think I should do better. And, and so this interpersonal feedback. We have time for one more question. Okay. Hello, Matthias. I, I just was wondering, you know, with all the, let's say, rock star style of Thomas Pesquet, all the um, highlights about all the, 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 let's say, like the armor you are broken to share with us, all you got, all this stuff, and all the support from, from the people, not the government, but all the people are like uh, discovering new world through your eyes. I was wondering also if you are aware of this also new part of the astronaut that is more uh, about sharing and knowledge and so on, kind of diplomatic uh, studying way. So, to be honest, when I applied to become an astronaut, I was quite introvert and timid and I thought like, okay, it's like, I think I can fly to space, I can do the research, but standing in front of the public and giving a talk, that was kind of a nightmare situation for me. But uh, luckily nobody told me that. And um, so I believe by the end of my career, I will probably for every hour that I spent in space, I will have 1000 hours standing in front of the public. It is really important. And um, I actually enjoy it because uh, people are very open-minded. People ask me like, what are your emotions? It's not, I'm not sitting here and feeling like I am in an exam situation. It's for me very pleasant and like whenever I like talk to kids, or kids ask me questions, that gives me a lot of energy. So that's, that's really, really nice. 
Also talking to politicians, I discovered that in every politician there's a small kid that has the same questions that we all have. And uh, so, yeah, it is it is a new discovery. Um, and and initially I was a bit scared of that, but you grow with the challenges, and uh, I'm enjoying it now. Well, thank you very much indeed, Matthias. And just before I close, I would just like to say that we have an awful lot more jobs at ESA than astronaut. The astronauts are currently seven out of a workforce of nearly 5,000. If you look at the screen over there, you'll see details of our careers at ESA website, www.esa.int, and the jobs.esa.int for vacancies. And of course, we're waiting with bated breath to see who will be the next class of astronauts, and we'll know that soon. So thank you very much indeed, Matthias. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and thank you for sharing your highlights and your perspectives. Yeah, many thanks to you. Let me please ask, uh, add one, one small sentence to this one. I realized as an astronaut I can influence less than like when I was an engineer working for ESC, I could shape projects. So if you have the wish to desire to shape space, to be part of it, to change things, to be active, it's almost better not to be an astronaut because we get procedures and if you deviate from the procedure they tell you you shouldn't do that. So yeah, it's just apply for ESA, it's a very cool agency, there's lots of stuff that we can do together, and together we can shape space and make dreams come true. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias.